On behalf of the United States, I offer a hearty welcome to the delegations of the 51 nations represented at this International Conference on Civil Aviation. I know you will see to it that the air which God gave to everyone shall not become the means of domination over anyone. Every time you catch a flight, you're adding a significant number of planet-warming gases. The prolonged heat wave in the Siberian Arctic this year is unequivocal evidence of climate change. The year 2015 to 2019, the five hottest year on the books ever. As you have now learned, the state of our lives is at stake. Without a significant reduction in carbon emissions, we won't be able to reduce the impact of climate crisis. So how can we? Personally, I think there is no such thing as sustainability because the human race, as well as other beings on this planet, they take from the planet or from the air or water without much thought of putting anything back. Any human activity on such a huge global scale is completely unsustainable. One, because of our population and therefore the demand for food, water and shelter is overwhelming. If the total world population was less than one billion, potentially yes. But at seven and a half billion human beings, we simply cannot have a sustainable lifestyle in the holistic sense. Particularly since the pandemic, there is like a highly focused on sustainability, quote unquote, because what that actually means is not really a well-defined coin term that we all know the concrete meaning of. The industry knows that it needs to change because it also depends on resources that are not finite, so it will have to change. But what I see as the big issue is that there are more airplanes being built and you also see airports being extended, new connections being built up. With that kind of development, I will argue that it's not sustainable because it's built on the perception of growth. We can have sustainability and we can have exponential growth and I still cannot make that equation go up. To me, that doesn't make any sense. Thereby, suggesting that sustainability is not the priority of the industry. Although there are suggestions of resorting to new ideas or sustainable alternatives, the industry is leading towards profitable opportunities. But why? Any industry, not just the aviation industry, but any industry, first and foremost, their task is to make as much profit as possible. Hundreds of thousands or if not millions of travelers flying everywhere because of intense competition between airlines because flying is actually the cheapest form of travel now per passenger kilometer, also the safest. But the industry will not give priority to promoting greener methods unless and until the passengers, the government, and the general public ask for some greener methods. The fuel companies want to keep supplying fuel. The airlines want to use the current equipment, cheaper to use older equipment, but more polluting. So they won't invest in green technology unless they are forced to do that. Primarily now we're using crude oil as source for fuel. Eventually it would run out. Necessary for the aviation industry to adapt in some way. If you look at how petrol is drilled out of the planet, crust, in, in my opinion, I might be completely wrong. There is no shortage of 
petrochemicals. It's just that we haven't found enough. That's why there is a, a hesitation. It will, you know, aviation sector, like all industries, is, is based on profit making. First question everyone asks is, you want me to go green, but what's in it for me? How will I profit? So until there is a profit motivation, industry will not go green. However, instead of profit, the industry may have to answer to loss, as a recent environmental movement has caught the world's attention. A fifth of respondents across the US, Germany, France and the UK had recently cut back on flying over environmental concerns. Some are calling it the Greta effect. Teen climate activist Greta Thunberg arrived in New York Harbor Wednesday, ending her two-week trek across the Atlantic. She refused to travel by airplane because of the large carbon footprint planes leave behind. And it is insane that a 16-year-old have to cross the Atlantic Ocean to, to make a stand. If you can make people aware of more sustainable practices through, you know, shaming or through certain social discourses. But I will say that behavioral changes through shaming, its outcome is not always predictable. Meaning that if you have legislative rules, like if we say there's taxation, the prices will go up and you have some sort of legislative framework to enforce that, you, you can more predict, you know, that there will maybe be less flight activity. If you are doing it through a discourse and through like kind of social shaming, it's less predictable whether people will actually change or whether they will just stay silent with what they're doing. I think it's come to the fore because Many other methods of convincing governments, fuel companies and airlines have failed to take notice of the argument in favor of going green, which almost everyone on the planet accepts that there are bad effects of greenhouse gases. But in our day-to-day -day life, do you really see yourself not taking a flight for 20 pounds to go and have a week's holiday? That attraction, again, is basic human nature. That kind of flying somebody can shame me into doing that but the airlines and the fuel companies will not take notice of going green unless shamed into it but shame doesn't really do much for industry that's a personal feeling electric aircrafts are in comparison with the standard aircraft? At present, just the one certified type of electric aircraft is, is really a very small step towards zero emission aircraft. So imagine we are at this stage where, which can be compared to the first automobile. Take a few decades for the widespread use of zero emission aircraft for transport, and it'll take a huge amount of investment at the same time as government grants and regulatory incentives to innovate and regulatory sanctions for pollution. But within that, you have to involve the public. And the public imagination is highly sparked up now in favor of zero emission cars and airplanes. So there is a demand and the enthusiasm for zero emission, but it's dampened or tempered by the relatively high costs. The cost of an electric aircraft will be much more than the cost of a similar performance petrol engine aircraft because it's such new technology. And to meet the regulation, the regulatory constraints, it costs a lot of time and a lot of money. So for example, on the Pipistrel electric aircraft, it's taken them about four years to have it certified. And the certification cost runs into hundreds of thousands of pounds, if not just around a million, to certify that one type of aircraft. And if it's a bigger commercial aircraft, the certification costs hundreds of millions and take years and years. So it's a combination of cost, time, to make electric aviation feasible as compared to non-electric aviation. And that'll, that'll take a lot more time. Regarding maintenance, is there a comparable difference between the electric motor? Absolutely yes, absolutely yes. So any electric vehicle has far less moving parts. So for instance, a piston engine will have hundreds of moving parts, all of which are subject to wear and tear in normal operations. 
while the electric motor has only one moving part, the axle. That's the only one that's rotating. The fuel in the internal combustion engine is converted into heat and noise. So the internal combustion engines are, are deemed to be about 25% efficient, while electric motors are deemed to be about 95 to 97% efficiency. And because of fewer moving parts, the maintenance on electric vehicles is less. The, the important thing to keep in mind is that the electric motor vehicles need a specific knowledge base for engineers and operators. And without this specific training, uh, uh, it, it, it may not, not work well. So the specific training is essential and is generally provided by the manufacturers. With electric aviation just around the corner into the commercial market, we can expect wonderful things, but the problem is, of course, time. Do we have the time? According to the climate clock in the USA, we have less than seven years left till the reversible changes. The question is whether we can make it, whether we can make the sustainable changes to occur before everything stops. Do you think the technology can catch up in time before the irreversible changes because of the climate crisis? I think technology is always slightly ahead of the climate crisis in very small areas where governments and public can afford such technology because of government regulation. And that reduces pollution in those little areas. So such islands of clean air and cool temperatures are not enough to affect global scale changes, which will require massive investment and change of personal attitudes. But in, in the global sense, I think the changes caused by climate crisis are going to overwhelm any bits of technology. On a small scale, yes, technology can catch up and even reverse some of the climate crisis, maybe in a, in a, in a protected zone, but not on the global scale. And only the rich can afford that. The population, the, the, the human population around the world will be, are being seriously affected by climate change. But this does not indeed mean that we will need to stop flying. If we are able to combine all the possibilities of converting to clean energy, spreading awareness and investing in more electric aircraft and all the stakeholders associated with the industry, central goal being to improve the carbon emission figures, then we will definitely see a change. So the future of aviation depends on you.